Hello everybody, welcome to another segment of JTV. I'm really excited about this one. This one's going to be really interesting. Um, one of the things that we are, we hear, we hear, you know, there's certain words that sort of appear and are very big in each generation. One of the words that we hear a lot come up is this word snowflake. The snowflake generation, this idea that we live in an age of physical abundance and, you know, we've never had it so good in so many ways. And yet people, there's, so, there's, there's such, you know, uh, physical uh, and men mental illness is rife. People seem to be struggling with coping with just, uh, you know, daily adversity. And uh, this word snowflake has arisen where people are saying that people just can't handle adversity in this generation. And I want to discuss that because on the one hand, I, I kind of hear that and I think maybe we, we, we have never had it so good and there is something to be said for learning how to cope with daily adversity. On the other hand, um, I think there are different struggles which come up in this generation which we haven't had in previous generations and that still doesn't mean that adversity isn't something to learn from uh, and isn't something, to, sorry, isn't something to, to be able to work on. But the other issue is that I think one thing that we talk about in this generation is this idea of getting more in touch with our feelings, not being shy to say if we're struggling with certain things when it comes to mental health. So how does that sort of work with the whole like, oh, but you shouldn't be a snowflake and all that kind of stuff. So I was uh, recently made aware of this book uh, by uh, two really, really interesting authors uh, who came together um, to write a book about resilience from the perspective of Israel as a nation, a nation that has from its very inception, uh, managed to not only survive, but thrive amidst uh, so much adversity uh, and existential threats. So they've written a book called Is Resilience. And um, I just want normally, when, they, when you're sent a short bio about the different authors, you can only show a bit, but I just feel like I have to read out what they sent me because it will help really inform this discussion, help you understand where they're coming from. Uh, and it's two, we've got two highly impressive people with us. The first is uh, Michael Dixon, who I've known for a few years now, who is the executive director of Stand With Us Israel, which is an Israel advocacy organization. And my God, do we need these organizations? Um, and they basically are dedicated to supporting Israel and fighting for Israel's cause and fighting against anti-Semitism around the world. Um, and in 2016, he was listed because, I, and I see this every day because I'm on Twitter through the various organizations I work with, he was listed as the 14th most influential Jew on Twitter. Well, that is, that's quite a, that's quite a title. Um, and then we've got um, Dr. Naomi Baum. And this is where it gets really interesting because she, she has a, a fascinating biography. She consults and facilitates workshops on resilience building in Israel and worldwide. And she even created something called the BRI, the Building Resilience Intervention, which is an evidence-based resilience model that has been applied widely um, around the world. She was director of the resilience unit at Mativ, which is the Israel Psychotrauma Center, and co-directed the International Course in Trauma and Resilience. Um, she's also the author of several previous books, uh, and she is an instructor um, of something called Z Gong, which I believe is some kind of like Qi. Qi Gong, right? Which is some kind of what a yoga therapy type thing. It's not yoga therapy. It's um, based on the principles of Chinese medicine. It's movement through medit. It's meditation through movement. Right. Based right. on the principles of Chinese medicine. Wow. So this is what I mean by we have two very, very interesting people with us today. Um, and uh, you guys are both based in Israel. That's correct. I know, Michael, you're in Jer Jerusalem. Dr. Baum, where are you? I live right outside of Jerusalem in an area called Gush Etzion. So how did you two guys come together and decide to write? Like, what, what, what happened? Because you guys have come from very different backgrounds and do very different things. So I was, uh, I've lived in Israel for, first of all, Oli, thanks for having us. It's great to be on JTV. We appreciate being with you. Uh, I have lived in Israel for almost 15 years and I've been, through my job, I've been able to see up close some amazing leaders and how they cope with adversity. And yet at the same time as an ordinary Israeli, I see how ordinary Israelis cope without knowing how often how a day will end. You know, you can wake up and then suddenly there's a war or there's a terror attack. Um, and so you have to be resilient. And so I've always admired this idea that Israelis are resilient. And so I wanted to write about it. 
And one of the first people that I interviewed for the book was Dr. Naomi Baum, given that she is an expert in resilience. And I was so impressed that I invited her to join me on this journey uh, to write the book, co-write the book with me. And it's been quite the journey going up and down the country from north to south, east to west, meeting Israelis of all different backgrounds and understanding what drives them and what helps them to bounce back after adversity. And, and Dr. Baum, for you, did, did you decide that this was going to be a way in which you could sort of crystallize some of your, the things you've learned over, over a lifetime of involvement in uh, resilience building? Well, I think um, it was, uh, Michael offered me a wonderful um, platform um, and a way to get some of the ideas that I have been working with over the last 20 years um, out into the public. And actually one of my, uh, one of the major things that I think about um, when we talk about resilience building is how mental health, I believe, can and should be um, accessible to all. It shouldn't be something that just psychologists tell you whether you're okay or not, or just social workers can help you with. I think people can help themselves. I'm a big believer of people helping themselves and, um, and helping each other. So I, the, the notion of bringing mental health to the masses, as it were, is something that's been appealing to me for many, many years and has driven a lot of the work that I've done in resilience building. So, for example, um, in Nepal, where there are just only a handful of mental health professionals, we successfully translated this building resilience program and I trained field workers uh, who work in rural villages of Nepal to bring resilience building skills to those villagers. By uh, When Michael invited me to write this book, Is Resilience, I thought, wow, what a, first of all, Michael's a great guy and it would be a lot of fun to work with him. Second of all, meeting all of these very interesting people, some of whom are my idols, no doubt, for many years. I would say of all the people we wrote about, Natan Sharansky has been really an idol of mine. So having the opportunity to not only meet him and shake his hand, but to actually sit and talk with him for an hour and a half was just a great opportunity. Um, and uh, to be able to combine that with my love of uh, resilience and anything related to resilience and resilience building and also promoting Israel. You know, Stand With Us is an organization that really does a lot of wonderful work for Israel advocacy. And, uh, and I'm very proud to be an Israeli also, an Israeli by choice. I moved here in 1987. And anything, you know, that can help promote our image in the world is something that I'm very interested in being a part of. So it really all came together for us. And right. I can tell you that there's no nicer person to work with than Michael. Oh, I, I, I know that, and I, I fully, uh, fully get that. Huge um, collaboration all around. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Michael, how, how does the? So, I, I want to talk to you guys both about some of the your favorite uh, people that you interacted with, some of the key pillars of you know wisdom when it comes to being resilient and all that stuff. But first, I just want to understand. How, how does the book work? Is it just going through different, uh, you know, Israelis and their stories? Is it, are some chapters just talking more generally about some of uh, Dr. Baum's principles of resilience? H how, how does the book work? Um, go ahead. Go ahead, you can take that. <laughs> no, no, I'm giving it to you. You go ahead. Okay, okay. So what we did is we interviewed, I think we have 14 interviews. Right. Uh, and um, each interview is really a story in and of itself. But what we did with our introduction uh, is we kind of laid out the um, lines of resilience that we're looking at. We call them keys to resilience. And we laid those out right at the start and then um, analyzed each story at the after we told the story or even as we were telling the story, we were interested in unraveling the various threads. Where does resilience come in? Where did it play a factor? How did it play a factor? So we take those uh, general principles that we've laid out in the introduction and we follow it through in each chapter. And what we do 
is um, very natural. There's some people who represent uh, one uh, key to resilience more than another. So we were able to capitalize on that. For example, I'll just give an example. Uh, Sherry Mandel is um, a woman uh, that we interviewed. Um, she lost her son in a terrible, horrific terrorist attack. He was 13 years old when he was killed. Wow. And and she and her husband, it was a terrible, terrible tragedy. It happened in 2002, I think. Um, her, um, sh they took this terrible tragedy and it became a jumping off point for them to crea create an organization called the Kobe Mandel F Foundation, which ended up um, helping thousands and thousands of families and children who'd experienced traumatic loss. And um, there was a real need for this organization and they were able to really dovetail their own need to make meaning out of their loss with what they saw around them. So that making meaning is one of our keys that we discuss in the book. And we highlighted that with uh, Sherry's story. Right, and, and Michael, what, what were some of your favorite uh, interviewees? Uh, and what were some of the sort of the biggest take home lessons that you took from those favorite interviews? Yeah, it, it, it's hard to pick favorites. Um, we met some amazing people. Uh, we spoke with Israel's first gold Paralympic medalist, uh, Noam Gerashani, who literally fell from the sky in an Apache helicopter accident, a horrific accident. He was presumed dead, um, but actually survived. And he spoke to us about his ordeal and then his recuperation from injury and what kept him going. Uh, and he was somebody who managed to grasp onto the idea that he'd been given this chance at life and together with the community around him, you know, community is something that builds resilience. It's also something that um, you see a lot of in Israel in different forms, um, whether that's a synagogue, a center of prayer, whether it's a school, a youth center, a kibbutz, whatever it may be, people tend to have these uh, communities around them. And also, of course, as a nation, Israel is so small that whenever someone's in pain, people feel it all across the country. And so there's a feeling of being a national community, and that obviously helps build resilience as well. So Noam's was an amazing story. He ended up um, playing tennis to a level that he was able to enter the London uh, 2012 Olympics and eventually won and it's a really inspiring story indeed. We spoke to uh, Ethiopian Israelis who walked through the desert, um, who went through terrible pain and terrible ordeal and watched people die on the way. And yet what kept them going was that promise of Jerusalem, of reaching the holy city and the holy land. And that was, uh, they were single-minded enough to get there. And then once Israel of their dreams, this glimmering uh, golden city didn't exactly look um, as they expected it to when they arrived there, they were able to have the flexibility, which is another one of our keys to resilience, to then cope with daily life and deal with it and move forward as well. Um, and so it, we've met with many more people. We met with um, somebody we call the keeper of the torch. She's a 90 year old who uh, isn't Ashkenazi Jew. She isn't Sephardi Jew. Her family never left Israel. They maintained uh, their uh, Judaism all over through the years. They simply weren't expelled from the country when the majority of Jews were, and they kept on going. And that obviously takes incredible resilience given the amount of people that have conquered and occupied this land until uh, Israel's rebirth in 1948. And so one of the things we try to do also is tell uh, thematic stories with each person that we interviewed. Um, you get to see an insight into their personal story, into their personal stores of resilience, but also into a theme that I hope will be something that people will really take a message from each chapter they go through. And then we, we met with former chief rabbi Israel Mayalau, who survived the Holocaust as a child and spoke to us about how he managed to carry on and get to the stage that he did eventually getting to Israel. Uh, he lost his parents, he lost many members of his family, and his older brother was the person who looked out for him and helped him. And we analyzed the ways that um, Rabbi Lau was able to cope um, in really to come out of the depths of concentration camp 
uh, and to build a family and build a successful career and to be an inspirational leader here in Israel. So there are so many lessons to take from really inspirational people. Wow. And, uh, you know, Dr. Baum, I know that you've, uh, you know, even beyond these, this book and doing these interviews, you've, you've spent a lifetime looking at this question of resilience. Uh, and we just heard from Michael, he spoke about some of the key things, the key themes that he's found repeated over and over again when it comes to resilience, which is things like Michael mentioned fle being flexible, um, having a reason, uh, uh, you know, to, to keep going. What, what, what would you say are some of the, other than those things mentioned, uh, what would you say are some of the key take home messages uh, that you see uh, from people who are able to, to, to be resilient? Okay, so I think that's a, a great question because one of the major points of our book is that we want people not only to enjoy reading these stories, but to try to figure out what they can add into their lives that will help make them more resilient. So there are several things. Flexibility is definitely one of the very important keys. If one route is not working or there's a barrier or you're stopped mid-track, the ability to sh shift gears um, and find other options and other ways of approaching whatever it is um, that you want is, is key um, in resilience because you know, um, as human beings, sometimes things don't work the first, the first way or the first idea that we have. And the more we're able to call upon all of our resources and, and um, think creatively, uh, we, can be, we can approach life more resiliently. Um, another issue is being able to talk about feelings. And you mentioned this, um, Ollie, right at the beginning of your talk, how the snowflake generation may be on the upside of being a snowflake is that uh, people share feelings. They talk about feelings much more readily and much more easily than perhaps previous generations. And it has a downside because we hear a lot more about anxiety and depression and uh, worries. And sometimes I think we give too much credence to that, being maybe a little bit more old school. But on the other hand, I know that being able to talk about feelings and touch all of our feelings is key to resilience. If we say, okay, I only want to experience happiness and joy. And that is, those are the emotions that I'm willing to talk about or to feel. And uh, no, no sadness for me, no grief for me, no worry for me. I'm going to just shut those off. What happens, the way the human psyche is built is what happens is you build these walls and then these walls exist for all emotions. You have trouble experiencing any emotion. So if you don't allow yourself to experience the pain and the grief, maybe the guilt, maybe whatever it is, these negative emotions, if you don't allow yourself to feel them, then eventually what will happen is that you will not be able to feel joy and happiness. Can I ask, can I ask, when you say allow them to feel them, does that mean sharing, allow yourself to feel sadness, does that mean necessarily sharing it with others as well? No, it's not necessarily sharing it. You can, you can share it with yourself. Uh, you know, I think just to think about it is probably not enough. Um, but allow it to come up for you. And maybe let's say if we're talking about sadness, go cry about it, maybe look at pictures and be feeling sad, maybe write maybe draw. I think it's important to find ways to express those feelings. Talking about it is one very good way of expressing, um, but it's not the only way to express. So um, allowing the whole range, the whole gamut of emotions, I think is essential in resilience work. Sometimes what happens is that people are worried. Usually I meet people after tragedy, after trauma, after natural disaster. And usually people are worried that if they allow themselves to mourn or they allow themselves to feel sad, they're going to kind of sink into this black rabbit hole that has no end. You know, they're going to just go down, 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 down and never come out again. 
And in fact, what we know about emotions is that they're very dynamic. They're changing all the time. So that if we allow ourselves to feel sadness, it doesn't mean it's going to be with us forever. It's going to be with us for a day, a two week, a month. It's going to be with us for a while, but it's also going to move on. We're not most people, most of the time, don't get stuck. Now, having said that, there are people who do get stuck, and those are the people probably who need to see a mental health professional. But it's really a very small percentage of people who get stuck. And most of us um, are going to move through this. Right, right. Wow. wow. I think just to, just to you know, follow on from that, one of the things that, that is clear about Israelis is that they're very good at telling you how they think. Uh, no one ever, you know, had a conversation with an Israeli and said, well, I just wish he'd been a little bit more direct. Um, they are very good at kind of wearing their feelings on their sleeves, whether they're happy with you, whether they're cross with you. Um, also, by the way, in grief as well, you know, when we see uh, Yom HaZikaron or God forbid, when there's a terror attack here, Israelis really do allow their emotions. They wear them on their sleeves. They allow them to show. And so that actually, I think, is an incredibly healthy thing in terms of building their resilience. Well, this, this, is, this is actually something I was, that was at the front of my mind and was wanted to be my follow-up question, which was like the stereotype that we have of, of Israelis and when you go there, which is, I, 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 I will never forget, this is one of the funniest experiences ever, which is I was on a Friends of Israel uh, delegation from the UK to Israel a couple of years ago. And we were going with members of parliament and baronesses and lords, most of whom were not Jewish and hadn't been to Israel. And uh, in fact, I think pretty much all of them. And we were at Ben Gurion Airport and in front of me was one of the members of the House of Lords, a woman. So if you're a female member of the House of Lords, you're called a baroness. And the Israeli uh, uh, security guard was basically looking at her passport. And he said, it says baroness, what this means? And she said, oh, I'm a baroness. It means I have a seat in the House of Lords. And he just said, good for you. Next. <laughs> It was, it was absolutely brilliant. I like the most perfect example of like the clash of British, like, you know, slightly kind of just like, uh, you know, putting on a bit of a show and all being into all the whole pomp and ceremony. And the Israelis are just like, we're fighting for our existence and so we don't have time for this. But one thing I, I did sort of, I do feel because I'm a British, I'm, I'm British as well as being, you know, uh, you know, at least, you know, as well as being Jewish and, and having a huge affinity with Israel. Um, part of the stereotype that you have of, this, of Israelis and, and that I kind of felt I saw in that example and that story is, yes, 100% resilient, we get that, but there's a certain toughness um, which I wouldn't necessarily always associate, yes, they'll speak their mind, but I wouldn't necessarily associate with being emotionally open. It, only in the sense that I feel like emotional openness um, also requires a degree of like, you know, uh, sensitivity and attacked for the other um, and I just wondered whether like you know how does that play into it because I definitely think when it comes to resilience you've got it in Israelis but in terms of like sharing uh, being, being open and being able to like you know not be like in I guess in like survival mode the whole time isn't part of that the emotional openness we're talking about being able to be a bit kind of do you know, you know what I mean? Do you get what I'm saying? I, I get what you're saying. Look, I'm British and Israeli, um, and my kids also, uh, you know, are, are both. When we moved from England to Israel prior to that, you know, my eldest daughter was two. So she'd been in kindergarten in England and she had had, a, I think, a fairly formal day-to-day uh, -day in her school. And then when we moved to Israel, the first, you know, we came to this new gun, as they call it here, and her first experience of education was that the lady who was running the gun, um, obviously you call them by their first name rather than Mrs. X, or in England we call them Auntie X, but that's a whole different thing. Um, the first thing that happened was that this lady just enveloped her in a hug. And uh, prior to that, she'd never had anybody in the educational system touch her. 
And it was right. such, uh, for me, it was a clarity between the kind of Israeli and the British mentality. I think there are great things about both uh, characteristics, but we talk about in the opening of the book, we talk about how different nations are characterized. Now, these are obviously stereotypes and gen generalizations, but at the same time, there's something in it. So how are Israelis characterized as the sabra fruit, the prickly pear? They're tough on the outside, but they're soft on the inside. And you have to get through that exterior to get to the interior. And that really is the essence of Israelis. They have compassion. They have sympathy. They desperately want to be loved. They will not show that to you necessarily in the first time that you meet them. Um, but it's definitely something, and, and part of that is a product of being in an environment, in a neighborhood, a geographical neighborhood, where you have very tough neighbors and you're used to a lot of animosity and adversity. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like the perfect, perfect mixture of being able to protect yourself and being, you know, on the defensive. And at the same time, uh, having that humanity and that openness as anyone who really gets to know Israelis will see. Uh, so, Dr. Bounds, do, do you think that part of resilience means you have to have a slightly kind of tough exterior to the to the world? Is that is that is that something? Because I have to say, it's just I don't know. It's just maybe it could just be a British versus Israeli thing. I, I totally get that, and my experience of what you're telling me bears that out, which is that any of that kind of toughness or rigidness, you push a little bit, and it's there is softness, of course. But I just I just wonder whether do you think that's an essential ingredient? I don't think that it's necessarily a tough exterior. I think it's like an inner core. There's an inner core there, the ability to withstand over a long period of time. You know, the th we don't give in so easy. So one of the things like I'm thinking about this vis-a-vis -vis the whole COVID-19 experience now. Um, so people are getting tired. There's no question that there is a burnout here. Like. Okay, we've been here. We've COVID. COVID is going on for so long. And yes, it's true. It's going on for long. But we know as Israelis that we, you know, things sometimes take a long time and we will and can persevere. So that sense of uh, perser perseverance, I, I, I think it's not so much. I don't think you have to be so tough on the exterior. I don't think that that's key to resilience. I don't. But there is a certain long term aspect about resilience that that does, um, you know, one of the definitions of resilience is the ability to withstand for a long period of time. And, and I think that there is something to that, to understand that sometimes you just, you're in it for the long haul. I think about the story from our book, for example, of Noam Gershoni. So his uh, rehabilitation took a very long time. I don't remember exactly how long, but it was about, oh, it's probably still ongoing till today. In other words, there was the acute phase that was probably a year, a year and a half. And then after that, slowly, slowly, but you know, if you're going to give up after two months, you're not going to really make it. So that understanding that you're in this and we in Israel have been in this in our geopolitical environment for since way before 1948. Um, so we know that things take time. It's not instant. And I think that may be difficult for people in the Western world, in Europe and in North America, where things haven't been very difficult or challenging um, for, for many people, um, certainly not for all people, but for many people, you know, things have been okay and reasonably easy and there haven't been that many challenges, whether they're financial or, uh, um, you know, threats on their lives. Um, and so when COVID comes along and it's taking a long time already and we're used to instant, so that's difficult. And then we have to really call upon our reserves, so. And I imagine, by the way, you'll say another, another element of uh, resilience is patience. Um, hmm. I've, yeah. never kind of, I've never kind of expressed it in that way, patience. That's a, I'm not sure I would use the word patience. Uh, but I think it's more perspective. It's understanding that sometimes processes take a long time. Pa patience is too much to ask of Israelis. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think no, patience no, is no. the word I would but, choose. But, yeah, <laughs> but by the way, that actually has helped a lot of people. We interviewed Dr. Amit Goffer. Um, he, his, you know, his kids won a ticket 
to uh, win an ATV, one of those uh, all-terrain vehicles, which he didn't want, so he didn't take it. Uh, to make it up to his kids, they went on a Jeep ride uh, just you know, to rent them just for the day. Um, that turned into disaster when his Jeep hit a rock and propelled over and ended turning him into a paraplegic. Uh, now, he spoke to us about, as Naomi referred to, that kind of deep hole. He was in a depression and he had terrible injuries um, to overcome. But actually, um, he turned that into creativity and invented the rewalk system, which helps uh paraplegics walk, walk again. Um, I should say actually he wasn't a paraplegic, he was a quadriplegic. Uh, and he's now invented a system that helps quadriplegics stand up and see people at eye level as well. So, you know, that lack of patience can sometimes be turned by Israelis, and I guess everyone, into having a very focused goal and moving forward step by step to reach that goal. And as you see in the results of Dr. Amit Goffer and the rewalk system can really uh, create incredible things. Totally. And one of the things that I find so interesting is that, um, you know, I feel like sometimes in this generation we're presented with this dichotomy where people are saying, you know, on the one hand, the snowflake generation, you know, where's your resilience and be able to tackle adversity. And on the other hand, uh, you know, the too touchy feely, too in touch with your feelings. On the other hand, we need to be more in touch with our feelings. People are, and we're getting these messages. We need to approach mental health more. We need to talk about these things because depression, anxiety is skyrocketing. And actually, one of the, one of the things that I'm, I'm really getting from this discussion is that the two, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. That actually part of resilience is being able to be open to be the expressive Israeli that can speak their mind um, and that these two things are, go, go hand in hand and there's a time and a place for the expression and the being in touch with your feelings and then there's a time and a place for the flexibility and perspective and pushing forward and being creative and, and, and taking that you know that uh, lack of satisfaction and doing something doing something with it. Um, a final thing I just wanted to discuss um, is really the question of is adversity actually given what you know Israel's overcome given these incredible people that you've and the incredible Israelis that you've you, you've interviewed would you almost say that challenge and adversity in some ways is a prerequisite to success is a prerequisite to becoming a, a real person of substance and, I, and I'm, I'm almost scared to ask this question because I don't want this to be true it's certainly in my life I don't want this to be true um, but I've, I've seen whether it's been my in my the own my own adversities I've dealt with or what I've seen with other people it it, it seems to almost bring out um, uh, such depth to people and I, I even think of the fact that Israel itself was called we were called Israel in the Torah because it says because you have striven with man and God and have overcome right our name the name Israel literally means to struggle and to overcome um, so that's my question you know it, it, is it is it almost like just an essential ingredient to making something meaningful of life so um the quick answer is that you won't, wouldn't know if any, somebody was resilient unless they were tested, okay? So you can't really, I remember reading this, um, Anne Mastin is a wonderful psychologist who's done a tremendous amount of research in the field of resilience. And she writes like, you know, people who haven't experienced adversity, we don't know if they're resilient. So the only test, true test for resilience is adversity. So in that sense, if you want to know whether you are resilient or not, you, you got to experience some, some, some kinds of adversity. Does that- it wasn't my question. My question was, is it a prerequisite to, 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 to success, to achieving meaningful things in life, to growth, right. inner growth? Right, so, you, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's a yes, no answer to that. Uh, I think that there are people who've had uh, lives that look to us, at least from the outside, you never know what's going on on the inside, but um, look to us from the outside as if they've had an easy life and they've been extremely productive and done wonderful things. So I wouldn't say that you have to experience adversity in order to achieve something in your life. I don't think that that's what we're saying. Um, but what we are saying is that when adversity comes, people can 
overcome their adversity and resilience is what comes to their aid. Michael? Yeah, I mean, only you were talking about snowflakes. Well, there's no snowflakes in Israel. It's just too hot. Um, so we... That's not true. Not everywhere. There is... Where's that? Yeah, I know. Yes. Right. <laughs> we have a little bit of it's snow. It's a good line, though. Yeah. Right. It rarely it's snows. It's it... up on the Golan, but it barely snows. Okay, so maybe we have a few. Um, but, the, you know, to answer your question, I think that you can achieve greatness, whoever you are. Uh, and I think that when adversity does happen and it's going to happen, that it's going to happen. And then having stores of resilience or having a coping mechanism by building your resilience will help you get to the next stage. And that's what we saw with the people that we interviewed. They went through a transformation. Um, they didn't want uh, necessarily to end up in the situation, you know, they, they hadn't planned, they hadn't planned where they were going to get to. And yet when they faced a big challenge, they were able to cope with it. And that's what resilience is. So the fact is each and every one of us is going to face adversity. The readers of this book won't necessarily, I hope, I dearly hope, won't face a terror attack or wars or bereavement. Um, but there are some things that we do know we will, uh, we will face in our lives. And therefore it's about how you then take that challenge, how you face it, how you deal with it, and then how you move ahead. Um, some people call it bouncing back, and some people, as we refer to in the book, call it bouncing forward. And perhaps that's what is re resilience can do for us. Absolutely. Well, this was, I really enjoyed this. This was a fascinating discussion. And um, if you want to uh, purchase a copy of the book, which I know I want to do now, um, you go to isresilience.com. We're going to put a link at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the video and in the description uh, where you can get a copy of the book. You can also um, uh, reach out to the authors, Michael and uh, Dr. Naomi Baum for sp on online speaking engagements. Um, uh, guys, thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. Um, maybe we can do it again in the future. I'm sure we'll get some follow-up comments and, dis and uh, discussions that will emerge from this video. So maybe uh, we, we, we can have you on again and do this again. We would love that. to come back. Thank you for having us. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you for all the work you're doing and good luck with the book. Thank you very, very much. To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.